Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome back to part two of uh, issues with the marriage uh, community, in the marriage community, in the black community. And we want to welcome everyone back. Thank you so much for participating the last time. We had great responses and um, definitely looking forward to having a very healthy conversation with all our guests and we will introduce them Actually, I, I want them to introduce themselves because they know themselves better. Just give us a brief bio of who you are. And I will start with um, Sister Samara. Sister Samara, again, briefly, she is a senior in our community, um, very experienced professional sister. And she, of course, is a senior in the community such as myself. And I wanted to have her on because we've had such a long relationship um, of her expertise and what she has been doing. So, Sister Samara, can you introduce yourself? Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah barakatuhu. That Allah's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. I bear witness that nothing or no one deserves to be worshipped, reverence or bow down to, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last messenger servant. Where do I begin? 1941, March 16th on the island of Grenada. So I'm 82 years young. I thank Allah for Sister... Madonna and her daughter for this honor. I have been in the United States for the past 61 years. I started uh, in the Division of Pathology and I worked at almost all the hospitals here in New York City. I was asked to set up a lab in the Spafford Juvenile Detention Center in the early 80s. And after setting up the lab, being able to draw bloods, urine, sputum, everything from these adolescents, no, not adolescents, from 9 to 15 years old, and heard some of the reasons why they were incarcerated. And I, like, I would say the word detained. Incarcerated is a strong word for little children, 9 to 15. And when I was about to take their blood, they would cry and tell me why they were there. So I decided to leave the lab after a number of 40 years and did psychology, behaviors, adolescent. So I started uh, at the group homes. After I got involved with the group home, the state department, I started writing the judges where the juveniles used to go to for their um, detainment. And I would say to the judges, this young man or those two young guys from Spafford, they do not need to go back to Spafford, please let me um, get them into the group home so they can be back, main, mainstream back into society to make a long story short. So I have been doing this and working with juveniles, adolescents, children of the inner city youth, city college. I was involved working with youngsters, traveling through the country when they were applying for scholarship, music scholarship, sports scholarship, et cetera. I decided to go back to Trinidad and Tobago in the early 2000, and I set up a practice, Samira's Oasis, counseling children, adolescents, marriage counseling, grief counseling, incest, which is very prevalent in the Caribbean islands. And I am doing it up to now. So I thank Allah to be able to share whatever knowledge that I have. And I am here as a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, I mean, thank you so much, Sister Samara. It's yes. beautiful to have you on. I'd like our next guest to briefly introduce themselves. Um, excuse me. We have our, our beloved Imam. Um, I would like him to introduce himself, please. Imam, are you there? 
Okay, he's probably not there right now. I'm going to introduce Sister Habina. Abiha, please pronounce your name properly if I have not. That is the lovely sister uh, Habiba, who is a social worker. Inshallah, yeah, please introduce yourself to us. Thank you. We can't hear you. Uh, I just the microphone. Hold on a second. I apologize. You're Wait, good. So, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, assalamu alaikum. So my name is Habiba Salam. I'm a licensed social worker in the state of New Jersey. I work as a therapist in the process of gaining my um, clinical social work license and um, I'm very glad to be here. I'm a member of the Meshid community of um, Kuba School and Islamic Center in Camden. Um, so I'm just very uh, glad to be here amongst all of you um, you know, amazing role models um, for me as a young Muslim woman. Thank you so much for being here. Nuruddin, next guest, please. Nuruddin, we can't hear you. Uh, forgive us, everyone. We're a little off. We have an off start, but inshallah, all will be well. Uh, Brotherhood, can you please introduce yourself? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Um, Hood Williams, uh, originally from Washington, D.C. Uh, I spent 15 years in Atlanta, Georgia at the Atlanta Masjid al Islam. And then recently, two years ago, I moved to Dallas. Um, professionally, I work as a investment advisor and broker. And I work for Amana Mutual Funds, which does um, Sharia compliant investment. It's the oldest and largest Sharia compliant investment company. Thank you for being here, Brotherhood. And our next guest. Our next guest is Sabria Mills. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with her. Uh, Sabria, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you're a behavioral therapist, so please introduce yourself. Assalamualaikum, everybody. Thank you so much um, for the humble invitation. Alhamdulillah. Um, yes, I'm a behavioral therapist and coach. And I um, run the Dope Muslim Woman podcast, the platform, and alhamdulillah, I'm just humbled to be here with all of you. Thank you so much. And I had the pleasure of being at the, um, the Muslim uh, African American Summit, and I had the pleasure of meeting this young lady for the first time. I must say that I am impressed with her experience and work. Um, and for everyone on here, we will be sharing their information with you in the chat, and we encourage you to reach out to them to um, deal with whatever subject matter you would be interested in doing. So today is going to be a very um, heavy topic, a lot, a lot of opinions. We're going to look at some statistics and so forth. And, and the question again, and let me just pause by saying this. Someone may say, well, why do we have a, a, a financial advisor on? Well, we're going to talk about all of that. So we will fit it, fit it in right there because that's part of how do we sustain our communities, right? Because when we do talk about sustaining a community, we have to look at our finances. So let's not be fooled with that. When we talk about counseling, we have to look at the emotional um, baggage that people bring, right? both socially from a social worker perspective, from a behavioral therapist perspective as well. Both Nuruddin and I have a background in child psychology. I do labor law as well. Um, we're authors. So there's a list of things that we're involved with. And of course, Sister Samara as well with the counseling. So I want to start off with the subject matter itself. And my first question would be, looking at the statistics. Now, I did my own research in terms of what the statistics actually looked like some years ago um, when we were talking about how, how we were going to engage this conversation in terms of Blacks getting married, Blacks overall, right? So we are a subculture of the larger culture, right? So we're talking about going back to the 60s when at least 85% of the, the American society was getting married, right? Then we move forward where now we're looking at 
30 year olds a couple of years ago, they were actually 30%, no, about 80% of them were getting married around the age of 30 and so forth. Between the ages of 18 and 30, the numbers have dropped drastically. Again, this is a reflection of the society that we live in. So my first question, this is gonna be a heavy jitter, <laughs> a heavy hitter, please don't take offense. Um, how do we raise manly men in our society? Now, one can take it either way they want to go, right? But we're looking at raising strong brothers in our community. And without strong brothers, we cannot have a community. I'm sure we would all agree with that. So I would like each of my guests to start off um, exploring that question and giving some input how do we start raising our boys to become young men, then to become men, to take on certain responsibilities? And I'm going to have the same question for women as well. So let's start off with um, brotherhood. You're the brother in the group. <laughs> so be our guest and tell me, maybe you want to share some of your experiences coming up as a young brother in the community, now a man in the community, married, have children. Just give us your insight on that, please. Yeah, definitely. Bismillah. You know, <clears throat> you know, I've always wanted daughters. Um, my mother passed away right before I, I had any children. And so I always, you know, really thought about naming my first child after my Umi, uh, Mariam. Mm -hmm. It just so happens how the law will have it that I have six boys, no girls. So I have two sons through marriage and four, uh, four sons uh, with my wife. So, uh, so six boys. So when I think about raising boys, it's, it's an issue that's very pertinent to me because it's, it's, you know, it's my reality that I'm faced with every day. And you know, one of the things that, that goes to that is that I was raised by a single father. So my parents were separated when I was young and my father had custody of all four of his children. So it was three boys and one girl. And so we were raised by our dad. And, you know, really seeing my father as a single father was uh, very impactful for me. I've always had this kind of uh, vision or this kind of example of a, of a Muslim man, you know, in front of me, raising me. And so I would say the first, the first thing is to show up. Um, in many cases, you know, there's no handbook for being a father. There's no handbook for being a stepfather. There's no handbook for being present. And that the requirement for being a father, especially in young boys, is not to be perfect. The requirement for being a father is to be present and to continue to be present in their lives as they go through things and being present in a way where um you are going to uh be there with them guide them and then you're also going to be learning with them and so oftentimes i think uh you can find brothers who feel inadequate right with being a father maybe they didn't have a father growing growing up maybe uh their ho household wasn't perfect and but I would encourage people to says, hey, but this you have a chance to make it um, perfect or you have a chance to improve that. So I think the number one thing is to just show up, be present, whether you're married to the mother of your children or not, whether a God is calling you to be <clears throat> to be a father for someone who's not your biological son, that showing up continuously. Uh, you know, one of the stories that was really touched my heart, I was having a particularly um, uh, just bad week. And I was talking to my father-in-law and we were talking about young men and being responsible and raising young men. And, you know, he was trying to give me advice as, uh, as a, as my father-in-law. And so we were talking and then my stepson, who's, uh, who's 16 years old, who's an awesome young man. Um, he, he said, can I say something? And I was like, okay, well, what is he going to say? And, and he said that when my mother first married Hood, I thought he was the worst father in the world. 
And I was just like, okay, like <laughs> I'm not really in the mood to hear this. He said, but then I realized that Hood was trying to teach me how to be accountable and then nobody in my life was holding me accountable. And so showing up for my for my son in this situation was to hold him accountable when he was crying, when my wife was uh, kind of insecure because she had this husband, she had this man coming into her life who was talking to her son in a very direct way. And you know, my stepson would be crying, he would be adjusting to it. And it, it really wasn't pretty and it really wasn't nice. And, you know, but I was there. And one of the things that I understood is that they said um, that men father the child who's in their home even more than who's their biological child. And so if a child is going to be in my home, he's going to have to be accountable for himself, for his actions, not in a way where we got to be harsh, not in a way that we have to uh, be punitive, but in a way of making sure that this young man uh, is kind of aware of the decision he's making and ultimately what are those consequences. And, you know, and sometimes it requires him also having consequences for his actions. And so being present um, is just the first step that you can do in really um, being there and kind of nurturing and growing young men. Inshallah, that, that I totally agree. There's nothing you said that I don't agree with. So I am going to move to um, Sister Sabria. Let's get in on this one, Sister, because I know you, you, you've dealt with quite a bit of this. And then we'll move to our, to our sister, the social worker. So please take it over. Okay. SubhanAllah. Um, so this is a question that I often struggle with answering because I'm a woman and I do not like speaking on behalf of my brothers. I like to experience them and hear them and be a support for them. But it's interesting because, um, you know, I participate or I facilitate group sessions for a variety of different um, black men and um, in, in a collective group, uh, like therapeutic session. And there are certain things that they sh have shared collectively that I feel like it's beneficial for us to, you know, kind of look at. And one of the things is, is they often speak of, uh, our, in particular, our black men that have been raised in particular in community have said that they kind of did what they saw modeled. And they saw modeled certain things in their community or by their fathers, um, and that's what they have on repeat. And so these patterns that we see here is something that I think we really need to address and really tackle before we can really come to a point where we're like, okay, how can we raise these men? There's a lot of tools and strategies we can do, but it's really important to understand something, that patterns are passed down. Behavior is learned. And a lot of times we learn behavior when we're really young and it's from our environment, from our caregivers. And that is what we have on repeat. It becomes automatic. It becomes something that we have in our subconscious programming. And it's something that we just repeat without thinking. Typically, if there's a pattern present, let's say that there was a pattern of, you know, maybe going from woman to woman, or maybe not really taking care of a family or being sustainable. Maybe that was a visible learned behavior. A child is going to interpret that behavior and the child may decide either I'm going that either they're going to repeat the behavior and that's like an automatic, that's typically what you do without much conscious thought, or the child may be conscious enough to say, I want to do something different. But even in that process, they're rejecting the behavior. And what happens when you reject a learn a behavior is that if you're not fully aware of like kind of how that shows up in your life, you can repeat the pattern anyway. So as you're rejecting, trying not to be, you know, this player or this whatever it is that you saw your father doing that was harmful, that you want to do something totally different, you may end up attracting in people that were similar, right? And still repeating that pattern no matter what. So I think one of the things that's really important to unpack is to understand that, you know, these behaviors have a root. And if we really want to fix and check this stuff, we have to understand that there are certain things that are on repeat, that someone has to break the chain. Someone has to decide that we're going to interrupt the pattern. Right. It's not just about like, oh, OK, now I'm going to get up and be different. I'm going to intentionally 
break the pattern and the cycle that has been on repeat for the generations of men in my line. And it's not easy work. And I, I say, you know, may Allah bless the brothers that choose to do something different. And because they become a model and they, they, they start a new pattern for the people that are learning from them. And that's literally how you begin to shift and change it. Because right now what we're dealing with, and as you know, as a behavioral therapist, I used to work primarily with young black boys of trauma. Mm -hmm. They would come into the schools and they were, a lot of them had a severe emotional stunts as a result of their trauma. And there were fundamental skills that, that are, are really critical that were missing as a result of this emotional stunt. I have a traumatic event. I emotionally, I stopped growing. I stopped developing. So all the skills that I need as I, as, as I make it through the developmental stages, I don't acquire. So of course, I'm going to struggle in marriage. Of course, I'm going to struggle with conflict resolution, communication, all these different skills that I'm supposed to acquire through the developmental stages. And so this is something that, and again, like for our, for our, for our men, it's important that these skills are things that we can still teach. There's still things that you can acquire, but you need these skills in order to be successful and sustainable interpersonal relationships. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I've experienced that myself um, when working in the public schools, which I actually worked there for 20 years uh, before transitioning to my present career. Um, and it is an issue. And it's very difficult, as you said, as a woman, to put yourself in that place to try and understand that because we cannot model those behaviors for those young men and we are absolutely depending on the brothers in the community who are doing that modeling in the most positive way to then nurture some of these young men as well so i'm going to move on to sister uh Habia. as a social worker could you please um give us some of your your expertise of things that you have been dealing with in the community and definitely share. Habiba, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, okay, yes. Assalamu alaikum. So um, I co-sign everything Sister Sabria has said, um, 100%. Um, but something that has been the most concerning for me is that, so I also have been, um, as a woman, sometimes it's very difficult to have that level of conversation. And also I was raised with only sisters. So I don't have brothers. Um, I don't have any uh, Muslim uncles or anything. Alhamdulillah, I have my father in my life, but you know, I wasn't surrounded by men um, growing up. But when I got older and started to work within the community more often, um, when I look at the Muslim community, the biggest concern that I've had with um, this concern is with um unfortunately people taking a very hands-off approach of raising their sons and saying uh and under the idea that boys have to make the mistakes to be a man and so it, it's kind of the complete opposite of if you have daughters because what i've seen especially with um taking on a bit of a you know therapy within the community where the sons have a very hands-off approach and they're going to make mistakes and you know, they're going to fall and have to pick themselves back up. But the daughters are like, it's, it's you know, we're, we're on the daughters. They can't make mistakes. And unfortunately, we kind of see that as the daughters being the ones who are practicing Muslims in the family and the sons are off doing God knows what. And in my opinion, to keep it short and sweet, um, uh, we need to have that same level of protection that we have for our girls for our boys, um, and this is coming from individuals who have fathers in the home, um, you know, uncles in the community, things like that. The same way that we have that level of protection for our girls, it needs to be translated to for our boys because our boys, we have this idea that our boys don't need protection. Um, our boys don't need that level of um, mentorship. Our boys don't need that level of love, but um, when they don't have that kind of secure, excuse me, security that our girls do, when they get older, you notice that, especially when it's a brother-sister relationship, it's like she got all the care and I didn't. And we've noticed that comparison um, with a lot of siblings um, in therapy. So one thing that I believe is that it needs to be kind of 
equal when it comes to how we raise our boys and how we raise our girls, but it has to be modified. We recognize that boys are different than girls, but we have to kind of give that same level of care for both children. Unfortunately, that's not something that is often seen within um, our community. So if I had to say one of the things we should really be doing is kind of remove that hands-off approach that um, that is so rampant within our communities and have a different um, and try to take on a different methodology when we're actually caring for our boys. Um, and this is something that begins when they're younger, but we understand that it can't, it's, you know, if it hasn't happened when they're younger, we need to kind of pick up the ball. And, you know, even if our boys are in our twenties, they still need that level of care. But unfortunately, um, that idea is, you know, they're, they're, they're fine they're they're men they'll be able to get it on you know eventually on ourselves but it's not it's not how it is unfortunately they're still hood so in my opinion we need to kind of um remove that hands-off approach that we have with our boys absolutely and um before i move on to sister samira that is again i'm signing off on everything you guys are saying because we've seen these patterns in our community and i too have often wondered why do we give our boys so much more freedom than our girls instead of holding them just as um, accountable and responsible in our community? Because after all, as, as they move through so to society or into society, we expect them to be responsible. We expect them to be accountable. But then when they are not held um, in, the, in the same position as a female in terms of you know, you have chores to do, you still have to be accountable, you still have to be responsible. And all of that starts in the home. If you then if you're then gonna expect them to be responsible when they're now young men and we've allowed them all of this freedom before, it is very, very difficult for them to now backtrack with all this stuff that you never spoke to them about, right? So these are some of the difficulties that we are seeing in schools. And I often say to parents, if Allah had blessed me with boys, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, we're on the same program. There is no such thing as you're getting more privileged than your sister, right? There's no such thing as you staying out of the house later than your sister. Why? Because you're a male. I don't know what you're doing out there. So Allah blessed me with girls because maybe I, my husband and I would have been a little more rough, but I don't think we would have because I think we understand clearly that boys and girls throughout a certain period of their time must be given the same treatment, not because you are bo you're a boy. And I know in some cultures, and I've seen it, I've been around some cultures where the boys run havoc. And it is the, it is the most horrible thing when you see the same type of behavior in now what is a man, right? They, they just feel as though they, they, you know, just own the world, but not understanding responsibility, not understanding accountability, right? Sister Mayor, you got it. Sorry, before we go to Sister Samir, just very quickly, um, Hood wanted to uh, just expand a bit on something Sabria said, and then Samir and Shalom. Sure, go ahead, Brother Hood. No, definitely. I think both of um, both of the comments were, you know, spot on. But even Sister Aviva, you know, my wife before we met, uh, one of the things she said is she wanted to raise black men. And the reason that she said it is goes directly to your point, because she said growing up, it was the women who were taught to, to do the right thing. And it was the guys who were kind of like, just let let them go loose and we'll see, we'll see what happens. And so she really wanted to raise black men. And I mean, like my wife Jamila has three sons. Um, and, you know, and it's really part and parcel of this larger culture. Like this larger culture has, this idea of boys will be boys, let them soil their oats. Mm -hmm. There's not this idea of chastity amongst men. Mm -hmm. And it's really unfortunate that we can't appreciate a man being chased the way we appreciate a woman being chased. But this is antithetical to our religion. Our religion tells us that the men, there's no difference between chastity between men and women. And so we have to kind of, you know, really ground our young men and ground ourselves even, right, as men, that we want to be men who are chaste, right? Mm -hmm. Men who are not having relationships, you know, outside of what God has permitted. And it's and it's something that we really have to, because there's other communities that have that, 
right? And so it's something that we really have to say, we want our young men to be virgins, right? Like uh, virginity is not something we value just in our sisters. Virginity is something we value in our, our men as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Sister Samira. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Sabria and Brother Hud has said everything I wanted to say, you know. But just a little to make it like Sister said, short and sweet. I have a blessing of doing counseling in the two cultures, mm -hmm. United States and the Caribbean. And at 82, I have seen, witnessed, and experienced a lot. So that dichotomy is something else. I was growing up, what are little girls made of? Of sugar and spice and everything nice. And what are little boys made of? Of snags and snails and puppy dog tails. That's what little boys are made of. So then your girl grows up and she has to marry a boy with snags and snails and puppy dog tails. We are socialized. Even though back in the Caribbean you're socialized, to respect your husband, to please your husband. But in the back of our mind, snags and snails and puppy dogs, tails. Oh. So becoming a Muslim and going home and doing counseling with marriage counseling in here and having some of the blessings from Allah mm -hmm. to bring Imam Waridin Muhammad's teaching. May Allah bless him with Jennifer Dows. <clears throat> Words make people. And I was blessed, and I'm not boasting, just testifying, that I was able to bring some of the Islamic marriage for the sake of Allah to some of our brothers in the Caribbean to change. Because even though they were Muslims, making a lot of money, have the houses, palaces, but the marriage was not good. And because some of the sisters did not know because they socialized that they sugar and spice and everything nice and he snacked it in. And like Sister Sabria says, that condition and that socialization is real. And on top of that, divorce, trauma, everything. So I'm just saying we need to hug on another thing. We have to hug our brothers. We have to hug our boys. A lot of us sisters are guilty. We don't hug our boys enough. <laughs> Hug them, kiss them. In this culture here, I see it. Even when I was at Spafford with those little detainees, when they come to get their blood drawn, they say, okay, I want to hug. And I wouldn't hug them, smell them. We don't hug enough. Love is real. Hug your boys. The girls get all the love and the boys. Another thing, I have my cock. Tie your hen. What does that mean? So your cock could go through the yard and I have to tie my hand. You have to tie your cock too. So I'm saying thing real that has to be addressed. And our brothers, oh my goodness, the imams, I thank Allah. Brothers, I, I, I love you all. May Allah bless you all because it's a lot of work. Like Sister Sabria, the tears came to my eyes. It's a lot of work to be done because the trauma and the, 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 the having the, the, the divorces, and then the concubine. You're living with this sister for 15 years. She has six children for you, and you leave, and you go and marry another one. And you have, you know, so it's all of that. Even though we are Muslims, it has to be addressed. And we have to set, talk to the imams now. They have to get real this day, 2023. I didn't want to get so emotional, but thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Sister Samaria. You scared us a bit now, because if you're not from the Caribbean, <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't know what she was about to talk about. I was like, what? She said what? <laughs> but she clarified. Thank you so much, Sister Samaria. I just love your, your um, emotional presentation, which is absolutely so valid. So we ended up talking about actually, how do we prepare young men for that accountability right uh responsibility and also we ended up with emotionality right so we're talking about the hugging and the kissing and all of that and in in our culture a lot of that is not exhibited so we have to do realize that some of this stuff is real it's absolutely well not some of it all of it is right so 
Yeah, when a father hugs his son, there is a special relationship to that. When a mother hugs his, her son, it's the same thing. If you observe families where sons come in and hug, hug their moms, you already know that there she nurtured him in such a way that he appreciates and walks towards her, gives her a hug, give his mom a kiss. So you know that there's a, a, a relationship there. The same thing with a father, you know, that there's a relationship there. And there should be, never be... Uh, a situation where there's a fear that, oh, if you hug your son, oh, you know, oh, Ma, I don't want you to hug me. No, you grab that boy and you give him a hug because he has to understand he has to be emotionally ready to move into manhood because your wife is going to expect that from you, right? Your wife should expect that from you. Um, so that that is so absolutely true. So let's move into, again, we talked about uh, um, raising a manly man, and you guys started off with, with an excellent, excellent um, demonstration of that. So how do we then prepare them for marriage? Okay, so we're connecting all the dots, right? So how then do we prepare them for manage, marriage? When do we start that conversation with them, given the fact that we've done all of these things, right, that are positive? Let, let's put the negatives aside. We've done, you know, holding them responsible and all of that. But how do, do we then continue that conversation into developing them uh, and preparing them for marriage and leadership, I might say? Anyone can start out. You know, it's, uh, you know, I was thinking a lot about leadership today. And, you know, I think it's part and parcel when you think about marriage to think about leadership and even more than just regular leadership to think about servant leadership. And, you know, we have this, you know, is this culture in many of our communities where uh, that marriage is seen as almost an accomplishment and not to say, you know, that marriage itself is not an accomplishment, you know, and as, especially for young men, you know, men is relatively, you know, men necessarily don't have a hard time finding someone to get married. And you want our, our young boys to have goals, to have dreams, to have things that they want to accomplish in this life that extends beyond getting married. And because what is entailed for you to, to, to make a marriage lasting and to make a marriage work is going to take things that are going to develop, right? They're not going, you're not going to necessarily have them when you're 16, 17, 18. It's something that has to be developed, it has to be cultivated in a young man. And so, you know, one of the things I think about just broadly when I think about marriage is to think about, you know, also, you know, I can use myself is that as a young man, you know, you will often hear about divorce mm -hmm. and also like, oh, they weren't good enough Muslims. That's why they got a divorce. But as I, as I matured and as I kind of looked at the situation is that I see uh, marriage and faith as something that, that has no correlation, right? Like uh, folks who are successfully married, folks who are not, or who get a divorce, it has no correlation to some of the faith practice that people have. That part of it is really skills development. Mm -hmm. And there's certain skills that people should have when you go into a relationship like marriage. Just like when I go into uh, uh, financial education or financial literacy, there's certain skills that I need to have. When you go into counseling, there's certain skills that you need to have. When you're going into marriage, there's certain skills that you need to have. Number one, I'll just give a three quick ones. Number one is the, the skill of listening, right? Like how do you really understand listening? If you want someone to understand you or to you or listen to you, if you start by listening to them and making sure that they feel heard, then they will ask you. You wouldn't even have to tell them to listen. Then they will ask you, well, what do you think, Hood? Well, what's your idea? So what do you think I should do? When we truly listen, then we can get listened to us. And number two, the other one is really like practicing empathy because, you know, empathy, you know, we think is something that is just innate in us. Either we're empathetic or we're not. But it's also a skill that we can kind of hone in because people want to be understood, right? Mm -hmm. Like we all try to 
have us understood be before we understand other people. But if we can really be empathetic, and this is for husbands and wives, and understand, like, even if we disagree, like, okay, we disagree, because in marriage, there will be disagreements. You could be the same culture, the same race, from the same city, from the same street, and you're going to have disagreements. But can we really be empathetic and say, hey, look, I want you to know that I understand your point. I, I might agree with it. I might disagree with it. We can talk about that later. But I want you to feel that I understand where you're coming from and vice versa. And I want to feel that I'm understood. Not that you agree with me, that you think I'm right. You might think I'm crazy, but at least understand how I'm crazy and understand why I'm crazy. And then that will give you information about me or that will give you information about your spouse because you know we're all crazy. It's just what type of crazy are we? <laughs> so, so true. <laughs> so true, so true. Uh, sister, Samara, I'm going to go to you now. What, what is your perspective on this? Alaikum. Alaikum. Where do we start? When people talk about marriage, where do we start? That is a question a young man, a young woman, we're talking about marriage, the, the skills. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. does it start? Where does it start? And like Sister Sabria was saying, the trauma that has gone, that has some of us have been through, where do we start? In marriage counseling, at, as, a, as an adolescent, at, from the parents, a single parent, a marriage person, we have to, where does it start? Where does this young man and young woman, not just the young man alone, a young woman, sure. because there's a book out that black women don't want to be married. I mean, we if you know some of the books that are out there mm -hmm. and some of us are reading it, why black women don't want to get married? They're making all this money. The man is in, was the, all the men are incarcerated. The societal myth has bombarded us. Where do we start? And Brother Hud is so beautifully said the skills. And then before I became a counselor, I had to get my degree. I had to do internship. I do this. When does the skill start? With the Boy Scouts, a lot of the masters used to have Boy Scouts and we had leadership skills and all that. A lot of things we have to revive. There are tools that we have to revive. So where does it start? So being, oh. and I'll stick with you for a second. So mm -hmm. being that you have been a sister who've been in the community and you've seen a lot of changes, right? Yes. What are some of the things that we need to start or putting back into the community that we once had there? Because we all can remember if, and some of you young people are, that are on this panel know that you've heard from your parents. The Muslim community was one of the most respected communities in America. Yes, and we had every we had everything. We, the everyone house. pretty much, I wouldn't say catered to us, but yes. they loved the idea that, they, that we were living on the block, living in the community because we had certain standards, right? That we exhibited that people respected a lot. I yes. don't know of many communities such as those anymore. And I think it is really our responsibility. This is it, yes, sister. Go ahead, sister, go ahead. The, the imams, what we have a lot of masjid hoppers. Listen, the imams hmm. in the masjid, for instance, we, I, there's, eight, there's eight masjids around where I live. I've been to the African masjids, and they have the children at Fajr, boys teaching them. The boys get up for Fajr. I went one morning because, I mean, I know I shouldn't have been out there, but I went it's just a few blocks away. And I want to know where these little children, the brothers, the imams have these little boys from six, five and six, teaching them Arabic, teaching them um, fiqh, teaching them. And then a sister came in, I went, I asked her, I come in, and she started teaching about to respect the system, you don't hit the system. The masjid has a lot, but with our communities now, masjid helpers. Oh, I'm going to Manhattan today, I'm going to the Bronx tomorrow. So we don't have the community that we had on everybody. I, I talk about 1969, 70, when I became a, a MGT. We had MGT cooking classes for the sisters. The captain had the brothers doing all kinds, their marriage thing, counseling, and we don't have that anymore. 
So, 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 Sabri, I mean, she is so, she just pulled my heart. It's so real. We've been to trauma. A lot of our Muslim brothers have been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Everything was fine when they were young and now they get older. Some of them are tired. Some of them say, look, I, I fed up. You can't get fed up. You have to start now. Me, I'm 82 and I starting. Me, I'm too old. Me, starting. Teach a sister, come out here. Let me teach you how to make bean soup. So you want to get married. And another thing, we have to read some of these books, even though we're Muslims, the Quran is our book of lies, but we got to read some of these books that they're putting out there. Black women ain't want no black man, interracial marriage. I mean, we have nothing like, we, sometimes when we talk, are we talking about the Muslim community? No, not only the Muslim community, we're talking to the people at large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have to have classes, invite, each one bring when you go to the masjid get bring a sister bring a non-muslim with you we it's a lot of work i'm not complaining but we're doing it we're doing it little by little so with brotherhood when he said the leadership skills and all that when and where do we start teaching it right so one of the things of course we want to we do realize with most things that we do it starts in the home it has to start in the home it has to start from the examples that we exhibit as parents, right? You start with that because much of what we do comes out of the home. So if we don't, again, when we go back to talking about responsibility, accountability, leadership examples and all of that, that has to start in the home. So I hear what you're saying. And I also hear what you're saying when it comes to the larger community as Muslims, when we're talking about what's happening in the, in the masjids, right? The master should be a place of refuge. The master should be a place of comfort. The master should be a place of where it's an extension of that nuclear family, right? So everyone is holding everyone else uh, responsible for those things. So um, Sister Habia, may I have your feedback on that? And again, we, we're having conversations. So if, any, if anyone says anything that you feel you need to expound on as a group, please be my guest. I think she's not, she's Sister, not here. Can you, can you, okay, thank you. Oh, I go. Uh, so, so, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, when we think about oh, what are we doing preparing our boys for marriage, I think on the other end, as somebody who has been raised as, you know, a young woman in the community, and witnessing what people have raising their sons for marriage, it's not the same thing that they're raising their daughters for. Um, the daughters know at, you know, four or five years old that lessons are being, you know, instilled upon them for them to grow into being, you know, productive wives in society. But unfortunately, like we said, the same thing is not being done for our boys. So mm -hmm. I think that when we shouldn't, I understand it's a very taboo topic to go to your five-year-old, like, you're going to be a wife one day. Like, but we're, we don't do the same thing for our sons. You're going to be a husband, but we do it for our girls. So that is one of the things that has been the major complaint with working with young girls where, you know, they are, you know, learning how, you know, everyone needs to know how to cook, men or women, but they are learning how to cook when they're young. They are, you know, learning the skills for emotional regulation and learning how to, um, regulate themselves they are you know have those kinds of levels of discipline being instilled upon them at a very young age but on the other end um it's this expectation that you know well boys who's who's going to marry these boys if they're not you know having the same exact thing so i think that when it comes to preparing men for marriage i agree with brotherhood is when are we developing these skills and i think that it doesn't need to be something that is very organized i think that it's not going to be right. sit in a classroom at a desk with a pen and pencil okay we're learning how to be a man it's like no mm -hmm. it really needs to be a lot of things that are started at at birth to be honest like when it's like it happens with those conversations you're having around the dinner table those conversations that you're having randomly with a family member inside of you know, the kitchen at the living room, it doesn't need to be something that is very organized, but mm -hmm. it's something, those are conversations that need to happen. And unfortunately they're happening for our girls because I can give you a laundry list of, of I, I could tell you how some of our moms are, are having, you know, training us since we were babies, to be honest, you know, five, six, seven years old, 
with this expectation that you were going to be a wife one day, but that same thing is not being done for our sons. So those conversations we're having with our daughters, we need to have those same conversations with our sons. Um, and unfortunately, I understand that some moms do, excuse me, feel like it's not, I have some moms say that it's not appropriate to have those conversations with our sons. But like, no, if you are there to have that conversation, have that conversation. Um, but as I said before, it needs to be the same for same, where if we're having these conversations about developing skills and developing yourself as a person, as an individual, um, we need to have those same things for our sons. When we talk about leadership in our communities, our imams are getting old. Let's be realistic here. Our imams are not spry young chickens anymore. They're in their, you know, 40s and 50s and getting up there in age. Who's taking their place? And so mm -hmm. these kinds of conversations need to be really thought about when we're teaching our children the fact they had teaching their children how to pray, teaching the children, you know, their far and teaching them everything they need to know. Um, so they can kind of understand that this is going to be your role. This is going to be you in the future. You need to understand that you have to, we have to have people taking over our communities. But that thought process was never really there, unfortunately that somebody has to take over eventually. And so I feel like in many of our communities now, um, we're a little lost when it comes to who's taking over after the imams that we have now. Some people have, you know, have plans for what they're going to do for the next imam in place. But I've noticed in many of the African-American massages that um, they really don't know who's going to take over. And so we, we should really kind of be getting back into the, um, the mentality of the same conversation I said that we're having for our daughters where we're preparing them for being you know good wives um we have to have with our sons because in the end of the day if we're talking about being a good wife for our daughters who is going to marry them if no one was having the conversation with their sons about being good husbands and then Excellent. we get into the conversation of the fact that there's there's no there's no i'm not going to say no you know good men out there but there's not a lot of options for <laughs> our daughters when we hold them to the same standard we say, okay, we think of standard that we're having for our daughters. We're doing all of this work to make sure that they're prepared, but no one fits that role. Um, as I say, I honestly think that when it comes to the pre preparation, it starts very young um, because it's not something that's done in a very organized space. It's done very in a disorganized manner, but there's um, value in that level of disorganization because it doesn't need to be perfect, but we're actually doing the work. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I'm going to say this before I move on to Sister Sabria. Um, yes, it does not necessarily have to be organized in the home because, again, these things should come naturally to us, right? Because if we're trained up from our parents before and then parents before, we are typically seeing, um, you know, what it is, what, what the role of the man is and what the role of the woman is. And you're absolutely right. It is not something that all of a sudden you're, you're going to sit down and have um, a meal or a conversation about. But it is by example, as we move through life, that we're seeing these things unfolding itself right and unveiling itself to say hey well i'm seeing my dad doing x y and z i'm seeing my mom do x y and z and again community we're sitting around we're having meals we're having sunday brunch we're you know we're going out to dinner the same questions are being asked of my that's being asked of my sister is being asked of me in terms of responsibility accountability and so forth so absolutely true uh sister sabria you got it I see, I see you I see you itching to say something. Go ahead. <laughs> so as we move to Sister Sabria, let's also bring in women, right? Um, Habiba made the point that women are getting prepared for marriage. Is that your experience? Is that what you see, Sabria? Um, and if not, what is the gap? How can we fill in the gap for men and women about how they get prepared for marriage? Bismillah ar Rahim. Um, I'm actually what well, I was itching to say, um, Sister Mary, where have you been all my life? I don't know where <laughs> you've been, but <laughs> Alhamdulillah. It's lovely to meet you, Sister Samir. Alhamdulillah. Um, SubhanAllah. I mean, I think you guys really touched on most um, most of you guys starting off with my my dear brother Hood, who mentioned about those fundamental skills and everybody kind of built upon that, which is really critical. And I love that you really outlined them very clearly for us. Um, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. You know, mashallah, I'm really blessed to be able to work with the youth every single day, mashallah. 
And um, I get to talk to them a lot. I get to talk to them a lot. And especially our young women, I'll hone in since that's your question, um, Musada Nouradine. And subhanAllah, you know, one of the conclusions I can draw, and, and I'll kind of break this down for you guys, that the reason why we're having a marriage crisis is because we're having a faith crisis. There's a faith crisis. Why do we get married? Marriage is based on a belief system. If our beliefs are, are shaky or, or under attack or wishy-washy, subhanAllah, everything that comes under that umbrella will be shaky. And many, many of our, um, I know as our brothers and sisters, but I'm going to speak about our young women, they are having a crisis of faith. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. Underneath the hijab and with their, they're trying to follow what their parents are saying, they are saying, I don't know about Islam. That's what they're saying. Um, MashaAllah, I coach most of my women are young women. And usually they're coming because they have a crisis of faith. And that spirals from, and, and there's a lot of breakdowns with this. And I see a couple of patterns. Number one, social media is killing us. It is killing our young women because it is a false far sense of connection. People actually believe that they are formulating connection through virtual means and streams. And that is a far sense, right? It doesn't cultivate actually what the fundamental need of belonging is. I belong here, that this is, I'm con deeply connected here. And all the skills that go with connection, you actually don't even require those, um, those skills that are necessary for true authentic connection virtually or in the social media world. They're taking that because what is being the seeds that are the satanic seeds that are planted and being attacked. I mean, you you will not believe what the things that I have to extract from what these kids are kind of dealing with virtually. I mean, cart, you know, uh, animated porn and all types of things. You do a game and next thing you know, you're in a total porn game. Um, this is what our children are dealing with. They're under attack. And so a lot of our women have um, a lot of our young girls have deep issues with anxiety deep mm -hmm. issues with depression and a lot of them are like isolating and they have issues with actually connecting and these this false sense of connection not really knowing how to connect and actually there's been a drastic decline in connection skills so people mm -hmm. actually not actually knowing how to connect especially since covid covid and and and, and um and on um but the most important point is this subhanallah i'm a woman myself i don't mind saying i've been divorced i've been remarried and, you know, there's, you know, we can talk about skills and all that, and all of that is absolutely important. And I'm a firm believer in everything that you said. But I'm going to tell you one thing is for sure, is that this, this, this journey, this vehicle of marriage is a means to reach our creator. And until you get that, until you fundamentally mend, right, our tarbiya, our rearing of our children is about their faith, their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until that's there, it's always going to be an issue. There's always going to be shakiness, right? And it's like, how, what do we do with our kids? We connect, we reconnect them, right? Mm -hmm. I learned about myself through my relationship with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I didn't know who I was until I connected to him and I connected to everything that he was associated with. And I felt like literally he took me by the hand and showed me who I was. And no longer was I looking for, con for, for my sense of validation and worthiness in a marriage, which is a vehicle to reach Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. I was looking beyond that marriage to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and inshallah may Allah make it so. But we have to put that in our children. They need a foundation. They, we like generations before we had that foundation, we had something solid. They're standing on shaky grounds. They're literally telling me, I hear it almost daily. Mm -hmm. I don't know about this thing called Islam. I don't know if I want to stay in it. They forget right. about marriage. They don't know if they want to be Muslim. So it's not necessarily mm -hmm. a crisis of marriage. It's a crisis of faith. And if we really want to attack this, we have to think of what is going to be our tarbiya. How are we rearing them? How are we connecting them to give them a real source of connection and belonging? How do they know that they belong to the one that created them no matter what? No matter how many times you got your heart broken, no matter how many times you divorced their sister, you belong to the one who created you. And for that, you will always be firm. You will always stand, stand on firm ground. Around. And that I feel like is something that our young people need. That's what we need, right? It's like every, you know, because everything else comes after that. And I'm telling you, I have every as a behavioral therapist, I have every tool. But I promise you, there's not one that has unshackled me except for connection to Rasulullah, um, Rasulullah Sallallahu and, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, being connected to Allah and through Allah's mercy, him con him connecting me to his beloved Messenger. There's nothing greater than that. There's no other really ultimate solution, and we have to remember that that is our job when we're talking about rearing our children, especially our young women. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Everything you said that I think we see that in our community all the time. And as you said, particularly when it comes to social media, okay? I know I've seen people have their kids on the social media for hours and hours and hours. I'm like, whoa, do you understand what's going on here? There is a total disconnect here. There, is, as you said correctly, they're being exposed to things that they don't even know, like, is this part of Islam? Should I listen to that? Should I watch that? You know, so how, how do you monitor those things, right? So I just want to move into really talking about, because everyone has said everything, and I hope that our audience are taking notes as well, because we're doing these series to pass on information so that we can improve on what it is we need to improve on, right? It's not just a conversation, it's about us trying to rebuild our community in a way that we knew it to be in the past. And there's nothing wrong with going back to the past in many instances, because you can take so many lessons from that, so many lessons. And I just want to end with this, and then Brother uh, Hudge, you can, you can um, chime in. Um, I was never part of the Nation of Islam, okay? But you have to give credit where credit is due. The Nation of Islam at the time that we, you know, around that time where a lot of brothers were incarcerated and there were a lot of things going on in the street, they were able to bring a lot of those brothers out of the street, make them men, okay, to be responsible to their community, to be responsible to their, to their, to their women, okay, and have a family so that we can sustain a community. And in doing some of those things, they contributed to the fact that there was a strong family unit. The Muslim community was known as the Muslim community that was an, an, an impactful community, right? People were turning to Islam, those of us who may not remember or may think, okay, um, Nation of Islam might have been a cult, they might have been this, they might have been, okay, we know what the deen is, right? And people come to things, people come to things by way of coming to things based on the information that they got. So I, I just want to say that, and Brotherhood, uh, before we move into the financial part of it, uh, please, I know you, you yeah. wanted to say something. Yeah, one thing, you know, I really appreciate the uh, comments for Sister Sabria. It, you know, one of the things I think where we have to start is that we have to start with ourselves. And one of the places to start is the dispelling myths that's out here. And one of the myths is that marriage is supposed to make me happy. And I've read this book, look, take it down. It's called The Sacred Marriage. Mm -hmm. He said, maybe God made marriage not to make us happy, but to make us holy. It was written by Gary Thomas. And this is one of the challenges with Muslims. I read this book. I was so moved. And I took it to my friend. And I said, you got to read this book. He said, is it a Muslim book? You know, this idea that it has to be from a Muslim to kind of benefit from him. There, there is no other better book on marriage that I've ever read in my life better than this one written by a Christian pastor. He's basically saying that this relationship is part of your faith, which is the same thing that our beloved prophet said, that marriage is half your faith. And it says that marriage was made to make you holy. And so when we get in marriage, when our young men, when our young women, and not even our young men, our young women, many of us as grown people and since Abiba called me out, I'm 40, so I felt a little old, like the mom <laughs> said. Um, many of us still think that our marriage is supposed to make us happy. That we get married and we're supposed to be la do la do I have a wife, and she's supposed to make me happy every day I come home from work, right? And when you get home, then you like, you're mad because she had just as bad of a day as you did, right? And then both of y'all are mad. Is that that if we have to get the, we have to dispel ourselves of this myth that this marriage is supposed, I tell uh, young people that find someone to marry that you can work out problems with. Because that's what's like, look, I, we could go to the beach with a lot of folks. You can go to the, to the Virgin Islands and spend a week there and on vacation with a lot of folks. But who can you continuously over and over and over again work out problems? And just one point is that usually the things that attract us are not the things that help us work out problems with someone. They say that opposites attract. But when you have an opposite, it's not easy to work out problems with you. But it's easy to work out problems with me when I, you know, one of the things that 
Sorry, I'm keep going. One, no, of, things that, continue. one, <laughs> one of the things that really gets me is when I'm disagreeing with my wife. It was like, maybe it's a hard disagreeing. That we're both praying to the same God. They're both of us. Like, I don't want to, I'm leaving the house. I'm going to the master. We're both praying to the same God. We're both asking for help from the same beloved prophet to the Lord, mm -hmm. And so when you can say, hey, look, if we're both beseeching the same God and God loves her and God loves me, both of us, that how can we not come together and work out this problem between us? Mm -hmm. That how can we not, because this is not, to, this, this is not to be la la. And so I tell, uh, you know, my nieces, hey, look for somebody that you respect enough that you can work out problems with. And the, the, the men as well, look for somebody that you respect enough that it's easy for you all to work out problems, that you all have similar values, a shared value system. So it says, hey, our priorities in this life are the same. And, you know, and we all get caught up. So I think dispelling this myth that, you know, we're supposed to be happy um, because when you get married, and you get into that first year, you get in that first argument, you get into that first time where you don't want to see that person, mm -hmm. right? And then you're like all disappointed, like maybe I made the wrong decision when you understand, but rather going into a relationship saying, hey, you know, I, I'm in love or not or so on and so forth. But I love this person. I care about them. But this is a person that her and I or, or, or both of us are going to continuously to work out problems. And I respect them enough to be my partner as we go through problems. We don't we don't have kids, we're moving, you got a new job, then we have kids, and then our kids grow up, and then and then even the problem of about one of them dying. I just buried a brother who uh who took his shahada in 1974 and his him and his wife been married 45 years. You know, just imagine how many problems they worked out. And so we have to we have to come to that realization ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then once we come to that realization ourselves, we can impart that on the next generation that this is not a fairy tale. This is something that's much more spiritual in nature because it's it's someone who's going to help you look at yourself. Mashallah, mashallah. Okay, brotherhood, you say right there because now you know what we're getting into, right? <laughs> we're gonna talk about the financial aspect of this whole situation. Now, how do we how do we begin to now prepare? So you guys gave some beautiful gems, and I'm sure the audience agrees with all that you've said. Um, so how do we deal with the reality of preparing ourselves financially for this adventure, right? This adventure that we're about to take on, how and the responsibilities that we have. Please give us some insight. Bismillah. Um, you know, I, I just read, I, I was listening to a podcast yesterday, 80% of marriage marriages end because of finances. And, you know, and that's like, that seems shocking, like, wow. But, uh, but it's not because there's not enough finances. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the thing that is it's not because there's no money. Right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the relationships that are that are getting into trouble because of finances, it's not finance. Finance is the battleground that people work out their power struggle on because it ultimately it's very tangible. Mm -hmm. It's a very tangible thing. Like I got a hundred dollars. How am I going to spend it? Am I going to spend it on you, you or the kids or myself? Right. So it's the power struggle that allows that we can argue about because it's tangible. Right. And so when things are tangible, we have to really, really, really get good in communication because, you know, you know, uh, you know, the reality is, uh, you know, families have money or they don't. Right. And if you don't have finances, then it's, you know, it's it's basically a very kind of rudimentary what you have to do. Um, you know, as myself, you know, when I went back to grad school, um, I left the working world, but I, I started getting a job uh, as a as a security guard in Atlanta, making seven dollars and fifty cents an hour, right? I, so here I am. I'm in my MBA program at at Georgia Tech, and I couldn't find anything else to help support my family but a, a job where I had to where I was making seven dollars and fifty cents an hour, right? And I was getting an MBA at a top twenty five school, and so. In terms of money, you have to do it, what you have to do. But then once you understand that, now once 
you know, you understand, hey, you know, I'm married, whether he is a movie star that makes millions of dollars or he's a school teacher that makes the school teacher salary is this is where we're at. And then we have to have communication with each other and say, hey, where do we want to go? Because I think whether, you know, money is, um, you know, they call money a hygiene factor, right? And a hygiene is that you only focus on it when it's not there, mm. right? Money is never going to make a relationship great, right? If you see the richest people in the world, Bill and Melinda Gates got billions of dollars, they're not married anymore, right? And so money is never going to be the solution of it. But oftentimes, not having enough money is going to be a problem. Not having good hygiene is a problem, but having great hygiene is better, is just as good as having good or okay hygiene. And so we have to, you know, first of all, you have to know what you have to do in order to take care of your family. And as men, you have to do the best you can. So, you know, whether that's uh, gaining a skill, uh, getting an education, going to the merchant marines, you know, you have to, the nuts and bolts of doing what you have to do to take care of your family, whether you're a school teacher or a, or an actor, so on and so forth. Um, but a after that, then we have to learn out how to have communications around money where we eliminate this power struggle that we have for money. Because 80% of the people who are getting divorced about money is not because it's in a sufficient amount is because we don't know how to communicate around this tangible thing so that we're both being able to um, express our needs. You know, one of my friends, her name is Shazi Imam, she's a life coach, um, and she has what's called the seven wealth languages because she's basically saying that everybody wants different things from money. So mm -hmm. money is the tool, but everybody wants different things. That one wealth language is freedom. You want the freedom to go wherever you want, when you want. That another person's wealth language is comfort. You want the comfort to know that, that your kind of um, substance, your bills are paid, so on and so forth. And many of these wealth languages is about how we grew up, right? Like what was the household that we grew up in? Did we have to face uh, the electricity being turned off for a few days? Like, and, and going back to Sister Bria's point, how did that kind of emotional trauma that we dealt with as a kid of not having electricity, mm -hmm. uh, how does that play a part in how we think about money, how we're having conversations with our spouse um, when we're adults in terms of, you know, the very real aspect of saying, how are we going to spend this finite resource? And so, you know, as far as, you know, I'm concerned professionally, you know, I focus on Islamic investing. And so for folks who have uh, disposable income after you're taking care of your bills, helping people build the wearable all to not just take care of yourself now, but to take care of yourself and your family when you're in retirement, uh, when your kids are going to school, so on and so forth. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not the 101 lesson, it's like a 201 lesson. And then you go to 301, like how do we do estate planning so that after we pass away, our children, our spouses are not fighting amongst themselves for for what's left behind. Like so, you're so I, I want to pause you. I want to pause yeah. you on that for a second. <laughs> so again, like anything else, right? We always look at starting in the home. When does this conversation about financial preparation start? Should we be starting this conversation in the home with our children, by example, speaking about a budget, talking about the importance of, you know, what what, what are your needs versus wants, et cetera? Take me back there, because for me, and I think for a lot of people, um, that conversation needs to start at a very young age when we talk about respecting money. How do we handle money, right? We know it's a tool to get you some of the things that you would like to have. However, how do we use it and having a child understand that? If I give you $10, I don't want you to be spending all of that $10 in one day. How do we then divide that $10 up to say, hey, you can buy something for yourself, put some of it in a savings, right? Whether you have a, you know, a little bank at home or something like that, and what do you do with the rest? And as we know, we go through life, we pretty much follow that pattern. 
if you're working on the budget. And sometimes people hear the word budget and they think it's such a negative connotation. I'm like, bring on the budget. You know, it took me a while to appreciate a budget. And I'm sure many people can relate to that. But take me to that conversation before we go any further. Definitely. Just to touch base on it, um, you know, the first thing that I noticed that even my own sons is that all my sons are different about money. Like my my 13 year old, you know, he's very detailed with his money. I have this and I'm calculating every part about it. My older, my 15 year old son is like, hey, where's your wallet? I don't know. And he's he's just much more of a free spirit. And you can see that. And so part of the responsibility I have as a father is helping them understand, you know, this is how, you know, Yahya is, may Allah bless him. And so I'm not going to change that by nature, but how do I make sure that he understands that he's going to have responsibility towards that? And part of that is making sure we have conversations about money, making sure that they have responsibility about money, making sure that when you give them money, it's it's in a way, you know, whether it's an allowance or if it's other ways where you're going on family vacation, everyone has X amount to spend. It's a way of making sure that young men and young women, because many of the times we do injustice to our young women because, you know, even as fathers, we take care of things so that they don't have to talk about money, so that they're not actually experiencing money. There's a lot of shame around talking about money, but making sure they feel comfortable uh, talking about money. They know how I earn money. They know how I spend money so on and so forth, so they see that. So it's it's getting them comfortable with even the realities of, of what it means to be an adult. Of course, they're not gonna be responsible for that, but making sure that the family is free to communicate about uh, about this responsibility that we that we have. Mm -hmm. So just on that point, Hood, I actually, inshallah, we, we are gonna move on, but <laughs> Hood has the financial expertise here. Um, so I wanted to ask about that because women, Islamically, they're entering marriages and they don't have to be providers. So what does that look like for a young woman to financially prepare for marriage? Like, what is the difference there? What are the particularities that women should be told to prepare for? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think, um, you know, when you really think about these relationships about um, that they're really partnerships. And oftentimes we have so much uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, disagreements, right, between spouses that you're not, you, we don't truly understand that this is person's our partner. And having conversations about uh, financial goals and financial planning and where do we want to be together? And of course, you know, even having conversations before you get married and saying, hey, this is this is how I'm going into marriage and this is how I'm coming out. What should I expect from you if this doesn't work out? Because that's a reality in our community. We can't just kind of get there and be like, I didn't know that, you know, he was thinking about this and I was thinking about that. And so um, and women also being comfortable for having those conversations about how she expects to show up financially with her husband. Right. Um, you know, especially if it's a mixed family, look, I'm, I, you know, I'm earning money. I'm looking to do this with my money, so on and so forth. Having those conversations, because I think, you know, the reality is that I haven't seen a one size fits all for it, for any relationship. And so since there's not a one size fits all, the best, the better we can do to kind of understand each other. Like, how do you feel about, uh, how your money should be spent? Um, you know, where it should be spent. Um, and of course, understanding that our, our wives are not responsible, but, you know, and then even looking at many people being in, um, you know, having, uh, having children or having um, stepchildren and how does that play a part and how money uh, is, is kind of divided, so on and so forth. So many a times it's really just really having a conversation with each other and saying, and then you then you can decide, hey, how this brother looks at money uh, is is he's too he's too tight fisted for me, right? That's a real issue, right? He's too tight fisted for me. Uh, but then also saying, why is he tight fisted? Understanding his history of money, maybe you know something happened, his father passed away, and his mother was really uh, destitute, 
And so maybe he's tight fisted for that. And so just working out these issues that we have around money through conversations, through understanding people's history, and then kind of planning to go forward. Because once you have empathy, like once uh, the, the couple is sharing empathy between them, then you can collaborate and say, like, how should we move forward? And just really having those conversations, because, you know, in, in many cases, there's no one size fits all. And uh, really important answers. And I think, Sabria, you look like you can add to that. So I'm going to go to you next. But I think everything you said is really valuable. And Shola, perhaps in the future, we'll have something just on finances because I have so many more questions from what you said. Um, but Hamnid, I hope that's a good starter for people. So, um, Sabria, on the question of finance and really just preparation when it comes to responsibility as well. Um, how do we prepare? We talked a lot about preparation, actually, Hamdina, but on the specific issue of responsibility and perhaps of finances as well, as well if you wanted to chime in on that. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. First of all, um, I got a whole lesson from my brother, Hood. He's definitely the expert. You know, um, there's something that my mother always says, and it's something her mother always said. <laughs> And um, she used to say, blessed is the child that has her own. And she would always kind of, you know, really remind me um, and remind a lot of the young, the, the women that her daughters that was, she was raising to have a sense of financial literacy and a sense of financial, financial independence. And um, I, you know, one of the hardest things is to help a sister that's really stuck. She's in an abusive relationship and she is completely financially destitute and dependent. That's a really difficult space to be in, honestly. Um, and so, you know, blessed is a child that has her own. That's really, that's really what I'm dumping here is mm -hmm. that, you know, while mashallah, like, you know, definitely we're building our families and all that. That's really great. But I definitely feel like as women, it's also important. Um, I didn't like, it, it's interesting because I didn't really learn how to pay a bill until I got divorced. And that was really hard. Like I actually had to go out, get help, somebody to teach me this is how you pay a bill because my father did an incredible job. I went right from my father's home to my husband's home. So I didn't really know how to do it until I was forced to do it. And it was hard because survival was in question for a minute due to this lack of skill. So I just don't recommend that, um, you know, in, in these days and times, I say build the skill, learn it. And, you know, it's okay to acquire your own wealth and, and as you're building your family and to have a really good, it's really a good feeling if you know how, you know, to acquire uh, wealth, uh, e even while you're within a marriage, even if you are at home and as a mom, but you are always, you're resourceful. I think that's fundamental and um, it, it really helps to support people if they have to navigate challenging times. Great. So um, I absolutely agree because I know one of the things that um, as, as a young married couple, that's one thing and my husband and I had discussed is that we each have our own separate accounts, but then also have one, one account for the family. So I had my own account to do whatever it is I wanted to do. He the same, but when it came to major things that we dealt with in the home, it came out of that third account, right? So we weren't, we weren't, you know, frivolous with our monies, but we also, you know, as women, um, and I can speak to that, that um, even though we have our own money, our money is still spent on the family. It's not, a, we're not running to the spa, no, no, I do like my spa, I must say. But <laughs> once a month, ladies, get it in, get it in. Okay, so, and he knows that, okay, you're going to this point. Yeah, I am. So, but I'm saying, and we'll talk about self-care at another time too, both for brothers and sisters, because this is important too. But getting back to the financial part, um, and, and I do have to say, growing up as a young woman, my dad was an accountant as well, but he took care of the bills and all that type of stuff. And even though my mom was a residential supervised nurse, she, you know, he did his thing and she did her thing in, in terms of her money. So for me, spending going into a relationship, and I can be um, absolutely transparent, I spent money. Okay. And I let my husband take care of the books and all of that. And he was like, okay, Madonna, you know, uh, listen, babe, um, you know, this and this and this and this. We got to balance the books. I hated it. Okay. And I'm saying this to sisters, I'm sure who are listening to I hated doing a budget. 
But as I matured, right, mature intelligence, I'm like, okay, Don, this is really now. You, you gotta, you gotta work on this budget here. Whether you may not like to hear that you spent a whole lot of money, but I had to pull back and now come into the real world. It's like, okay, you have a goal together, so you need to make sure that you're putting your monies, some monies towards that. And again, a woman needs to have her own money. And I'm saying this to sisters out there and brothers. A sister has to have her own money. We're encouraged to be educated, right? Um, Sister Khadija, prophet's wife, may, may, may she be blessed and may he be blessed as well, how she was a businesswoman, okay? She had her own money. She And she opened other businesses, okay? And even though she was married twice to rich men, she took that money and she put it again towards the family. So if we want to see examples of that in, in our um, Holy Quran, you can see that, you can see that in Hadith. And I, as I got older and obviously more mature and wise, I'm like, okay, this is how I can build my own financial wealth as well. And my husband signed on to that as well. So again, I'm saying to both brothers and sisters, this is something important that we really need to talk about more in our community. Because oftentimes you run, I, I personally, I can only speak for myself, I run into other Muslims who seem to think that they should be in poverty in order to be a good Muslim. Like, you know, oh, I'm not gonna aspire to this. I'm not gonna get into, I'm not gonna invest in this. I'm not gonna do that. And brotherhood, you know, I'm going to bring you back because I really need for you to talk to the people the importance about finances and about all of the investment opportunities that we have out there. And people may, you know, I'm sure we're going to have some people like, oh, I don't want to hear about this. They're going somewhere else. But this is part of our world, right? But again, having our own finances as women is extremely important. And we know, our brothers know this, that we are not going to selfishly spend on ourselves and not spend on the family. So I'm just saying that to say, sisters, get your own accounts if you can afford to do so. But again, don't be afraid of doing a budget. You know, a budget brings to you the, the realization of what it is you actually do with your money. And again, money means different things to different people. But that money does not necessarily mean, you know, hey, I'm just going to spend it as, as I choose and just spend it frivolously. So, sisters, um, chime in if you have something to share about that. And then, Brotherhood, you can come back in. Um, yeah, quickly. Um, so I completely agree with everyone. Um, um, very similar to Sister Sabria, my mother. She, you know, my love bless her. Amazing woman. She was like, before you get married, you need to make sure that you're financially secure. And um, because she was someone who was always financially secure, my mother worked the entire time of our childhood. Uh, alhamdulillah, she was a corrections officer and my father was a chaplain. Now, if we want to look at the salaries, one makes more than another. And I'm not going to say who, um, mm -hmm. but we understand that we have to be realistic when it comes to what money looks like with each family but from lived experience i understand that for me i am okay with providing in a certain context but um my money is of course my money i'm a social worker i make you know my salary i'm saving my salary and that's something that is that i am comfortable with doing now if i wanted to my mother was someone who paid bills and that's not a bad thing i don't think that we need to always i've sometimes have heard in many of them um, unfortunately spaces like oh your woman's paying bills oh there must be a, a marriage going south when it's like no it works for certain families and we need to be understanding of which families it works for mm -hmm. um but yeah, my mom pays bills. And I understand that when, if I was to get married in certain contexts, of course, I don't mind that because I know what it looks like within my lived experience. But when it comes to the finances, it's something that communication is definitely like the key because you notice that it is something that can take a marriage south if we're not communicating about something as small. As, sometimes we think finances, is, it's not that big of a deal. And that's something that I've heard for many people, like, oh, it's just the money, but it's like, this is something that can create a lot of fitness within your marriage if you don't pay attention to your finances. Um, and on the lines of what you were saying earlier about, you know, how we prepare our children, 
um, for finances, I'm going to be 100% honest. I think it's something that is depending on age appropriateness of how we kind of train our children with how we let them use money and how they earn money. So for example, I know growing up when everyone, you know, might receive a little bit of Eid, a little bit of Eid money. How are you spending your Eid money? How are you saving your Eid money? Um, instead of what we're seeing a lot now where children are just, you know, I, I didn't know the hold that Roblox and all of these other things had on this generation, but they will take a credit card and run the bill up, you know, hundreds of dollars on gaming things. And it's like, why aren't we reeling our children in with that level of financial responsibility? So when it comes to an age appropriate way to manage finances for your children, it can look like, okay, you get ten dollars in you know um you know roblox money you know a month and this is you know how are you going to budget that um just to kind of put it in their reality but it's it's something that's very important to kind of do stage by stage because you can't just throw a child who's 16 with financial responsibilities and expect them to understand it when they might have had freedom with their finances when they were younger so it's definitely something that starts very young um but yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Sister Samira. So I'm so sorry to I'm sorry. go ahead, Nur. Intercept again. Um, inshallah, Brotherhood wants to share some last bit of financial advice with us. He has to go. So thank you, Brotherhood. Yeah, no you problem. Well, um, you know, one of the things I tell my sons is that, you know, people like me who live in who work in corporate America, that we sit in a room and we meet about how to separate you from your money. And it's called marketing. And people are sitting around and we're saying, how can we get people to spend more money? And we live in a culture that is, you know, there's many challenges in our culture. One of the largest challenges is consumerism, right? You get money, you spend it, buy this, buy that. You know, and one example is that my son wanted to buy a new outfit for Roblox. And so I said that I asked him, I said, you want to take real money that can buy you food, that can buy other things and buy a virtual outfit. Mm -hmm. I said, real money and to buy a virtual outfit. Well, he said, well, it's only going to be offered until uh, 10 o'clock today. And then they're never going to offer it again. So I have to get it now. And I said, what are they going to offer next week at 10 o'clock? Oh, there's going to be another outfit. I said, what is it? I, I said, why do you think that they're giving you this time limit that you have to buy it by 10 o'clock? And so having conversations with our, of our children to, to, to be aware of this consumerist culture that we, that we have, one. Number two is that, you know, investing is so important. Um, investing, you know, I look at investing as one of the primary tenets of our face is Faith is delayed gratification. So we're not going to gratify ourselves today because we're going to put something away for the hereafter. So in, in, in our life, it's good deeds, it's charity, so on and so forth. But that's what investing is in this dunya, is mm -hmm. that you're putting something away. So for example, if your husband is out here doing what he can, taking care of the family, that uh, a, the spouse or the other spouse has the opportunity to invest for the future. And when you think about investing, you know, one of the uh, kind of investing hacks is called the rule of 72. So if you take the number 72 and you divide it by the rate of return for your investment, say you're getting a 10% rate of return, that's how long it will take for your money to double. So your money will double if you have a 10% rate of return every 7.2 years. So if you put in $10,000 today, when you're 40, it would be, you know, It'll be 20, then it'll be 40, then it'll be 80, then it'll be 160, then it'll be 320. Because every doubling is going to uh, kind of create the wealth. And so if you have residual income, right, you're going to spend a, spend a portion, you're going to give a portion in charity, but also think about saving and investing part of that portion because it will, it will kind of boost uh, your income um, in future years. And then the last one is, and I know Sister Madonna, we talked about this, is about insurance. And, you know, I work in the field of Islamic finance. So Islamic home financing, uh, Islamic insurance, Islamic investing, all of these things. I've studied it in Malaysia and across the world. And so insurance is a little tricky. Like some people will tell you it's haram, so on and so forth. 
But if I go to one of the, you know, AMJA, American Muslim Jurors Association, they had a, a white paper on Islamic finance and they talked about insurance. And they said that insurance, because it's Gorard, it's uncertainty, that you just got to stay away from it, except if you're old mm -hmm. and you think about what's going to be left for your children and you're worried about that, then you can proceed with term insurance. And what, what these scholars have missed out on is that you can't buy insurance when you're old and when you're sick. It, that's not how insurance works. It's not, it's not just to be bought by people yeah. who are in poor health and who are older because you're going to have such a high premium. And so for our community, especially, you know, I can't speak for other communities, but for our community, especially seeing our, especially seeing our sisters out here where their husbands die uh, in very tragic situations, um, being left with kids and then being left with this full responsibility. And then we do a GoFundMe campaign and we raise something like $7,000 that, that, don't leave it as men. We cannot leave it on the GoFundMe community to take care of our families if something happens to us, God forbid. Mm -hmm. So getting term insurance that says, hey, if something happens to me while my wife is coping with the loss of her spouse, while my wife is coping with having to raise these children without me, let me not let her also have to worry about where's the mortgage going to come from next month or mm -hmm. where's the rent going to come from next month. Or how is this car going to be paid next month? Mm -hmm. And that we have to think about if we if you buy insurance when you're young, if you buy it when you're 20, 25, you can get, you know, thirty dollars. You can get five hundred thousand dollars of life insurance, term life insurance. If something happens to you, you know that you're your wife. And this is for men, too, because mm -hmm. God forbid, if something happens to my wife, uh, who's right now, who's uh, my wives who are at home taking care of our children, homeschooling, so on and so forth. I would be I would be in a serious situation where I would need the the wherewithal to take some time off of work, to spend some time with my children, to make sure that they are uh, getting the therapy they need, the other things that they're adjusting to this new life. And so while I say that, you know, that, you know, term life insurance, especially is a very is a necessity in many of our communities, especially if you don't have ten, twenty thousand dollars in the bank that term life insurance right is something that will will if the if the unforeseeable happens if the god forbid if if you or your spouse dies it will be something to lighten this load that we have mm -hmm. and so it's something that i uh, i encourage and even even when you go to places like malaysia which has the broadest kind of islamic finance infrastructure in the world uh, they have term life insurance contracts they call them to couple and it's similar to the ones we have offer here I thank you so much. And this, and folks, this is just uh, um, an introduction because for me, um, being financially ready is so important. And I think in our Muslim communities, we are so lacking in this. And somehow we think it's a taboo to be prepared for in case any tragedies come about and so forth. And as he correctly said, and him and I had a conversation about this uh, prior to this, that... Um, yeah, it, it really bothers me that every time there's a death, there's this some GoFundMe, okay? Why aren't we preparing ourselves financially to take care of our beloveds as they pass? And not only that, why aren't we leaving the funds necessary, the financial stability necessary to take care of your children, your wives? Okay, this is a responsibility that, that a man should have that when, when something happens, his wife can be taken care of and not while she's working through all of the stuff as Brotherhood said. So we're definitely gonna have Brotherhood back in and some other financial experts to start this conversation for you ready to think about, you know, how do we start moving in that direction to build financial wealth stability in our communities. Brotherhood, I thank you so much because I know that you have um, another engagement but you definitely brought us some gems. I appreciate you being on, and we're going to see you again shortly. Just for right. your family. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. So, um, anyone who wants to reach Brotherhood can do so at h.williams at saturna.com. That's S A T U R N A.com. So, h.williams at saturna.com, inshallah. 
Um, and we do want to make a note, of course, life insurance. Someone asked in the comments, is life insurance halal? Um, alhamdulillah, this is a primarily a knowledge platform. You all have access to Imam Ali Muhammad, I think most days, alhamdulillah. So please do ask him and get clarification on that issue. It is a sensitive topic, so please get the accurate Islamic knowledge. Um, of course, our brotherhood, alhamdulillah, has our best interest, but everyone should to, should seek out that knowledge for themselves. So we do want to go to the comments as we also go to our um, other panelists. So if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, and Mom, I know you wanted to go to Sister Samara while I uh, sift through the comments and show I do. Sister Samara, do you have anything, anything you'd like to contribute to the financial aspect of this? I think your, your mic is off, hand. You put it on, nobody? <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. My mommy told me you must have your own account, a passport, and a driver's license. And this is what I have been married and divorced four times. Sabria, so where's Sabria? He's coming She's back. <laughs> but she's back. And this particular brother says his money is mine, mine is mine, and his is mine. So, Sabria, my dear, I've been married, divorced four times because when I accepted Al Islam, Allah made me strong, humble but strong. But I have my own account. And this fourth marriage, God bless him. 39 years marriage, he is 11 years my junior. I'm 82 and he will be 71 in November. May Allah bless him. Amen. His money is mine, my money is mine. Alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you, Sabria. You said so much that I really, really want to meet you. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. <laughs> and this Thank is the beauty of having this generational communication across the line. This is something that we really talked about. And again, if some of the sisters that I've met at the summit and I asked you to reach out to me, I really do want to hear from you because we do want to have these generational conversations across the, the border. We can each one teach one to develop something that is extremely positive for our community. So again, I'm asking those young sisters, I met some beautiful sisters, they're, they're, their face is still ingrained in my head, but I do not remember your names, but you know where to reach me now. So I'm waiting to get a call from you, okay? This is a community conversation. So let's move on. Okay, Nuri, get some um, comments. Would you like to respond to them? Yes. Actually, alhamdulillah, so we, we let you all know that if you wanted your comment to be prioritized, then you could go to our Google Doc and we would uh, prioritize your question. So, inshallah, let's do exactly that. And this question, alhamdulillah, it covers a lot. It's a personal question, but it covers a lot in terms of issues in marriage. So bear with me as I read the question. Uh, inshallah, we'd love for to get you guys insights, um, and you can touch on a part of it, a part of it, if you want, instead of the whole thing. So here is a question, and we really hope that whoever um, sent it, because the survey is anonymous, we really hope that you are listening, inshallah, inshallah um, and get the advice that you need. So the question is: My husband and I have often uh, argued, and we fight sometimes physical in front of our children. Oldest are 12 and 10 years old. Youngest are three and one. We do make up and show them the versatility of marriage. However, I'm afraid that we may negatively impact the way they perceive marriage. I've even heard the oldest say that she does not want to get married because of the fight she has witnessed us have. What is the best way to argue fight? Should we avoid arguing in front of the children? Or is that giving a false representation of marriage? How can I begin to, to repair the way my children view marriage? So inshallah, um, I would love to go to Sabria first, if that is okay. 
subhanallah oof um oh okay so subhanallah um so i i don't i want to i want to make sure um and may allah help us but i want to make sure that i'm clear that we never want to normalize physical violence in any relationship okay um we uh anytime you know conflicts become physical and they step in the realm of, of, of very severe abuse, harm, violations that, um, you know, can be very dangerous. So I don't want us to sort of just talk about kind of communication patterns and brush over the idea that this is a very dangerous um, um, pattern that has been created in the relationship. And, um, you know, it is one that obviously is, is escalated. And so, you know, as you kind of, can, I think it's important that a person analyzes what a escalates or how they escalate um, and what mm -hmm. is kind of brewing there, right? And so it's really interesting because I kind of, you know, I, I work, you know, with individuals that, you know, sort of work with de-escalation, right? So a lot of de-escalation techniques. And I think for this individual, like that's, that's number one is like, what's, who's, you know, who can be the one that can de-escalate? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you see the onset of a trigger, when people get triggered, right, they typically go into their patterns. Their patterns are what kind of come, the, and, and it's what you have on repeat. So if your trauma response to a difficult situation is fight, for example, like you're fighting, that will escalate. You will see the trigger. You will see the signs. So my question is, is what is being done to de-escalate? So I think de-escalation techniques is really what is needed so that it doesn't go physical. And like there needs to be some fundamental agreements made, right? It needs to be some fundamental agreements made in this relationship, whereas that physical component is completely taken off of the table. Like really, I, I don't like there should be no conflict if it, if it, if it, if it, uh, like you guys could, should retreat and return back if the fear is escalation to physical, right? Mm -hmm. And so there has to be an agreement. And I remember, you know, when I um, was working with another coach and she was talking about like having certain prompts or certain certain things that you state when, uh, when a situation becomes escalated. And as we are married, we know our partner's triggers. So as it's triggered, there may be a statement or a prompt said like, hey, I am triggered, I'm going to go get space. That's fundamentally important to know when you are being triggered, when the things are being escalated to to kind of give yourself some space. Space is going to be what you can use in order to re restore safety in the environment and then coming back to the table when people are calm. But really, like I said, fundamentally, there has to be agreement around taking physical off the table. So it's not even a question of whether it's harming the children, it absolutely is. It's a very difficult pattern that has, to, that has to stop immediately. And then there has to be some fundamental agreements made as to when things escalate, when, we, when each other gets, when one another get triggered, what are we gonna say to support? I remember I had a really, um, you know, uh, I worked with someone really volatile and um you know what i would what i offered as a communication prompt as is saying when i noticed that they were getting triggered and escalating i told them i told them at a place of calm i said listen when i perceive your escalation or your trigger what i'm going to say to you is that hey i noticed that you're getting triggered okay what do you need Right. And if they're still kind of escalating things like that, and then I'll say, you know what, I'm going to remove myself from the situation and I'll return when you calm down. Right. And so I kind of gave and I kind of like predetermined that I pre like we, we, we prepared that when we were calm. And then that way it was something that everyone was aware and communicated well when the trigger when there was an onset of a trigger. But again, like I said, these sort of patterns, we have to be really careful because these are patterns that we pass on that people repeat. Communication patterns is one of those things that we pass down from generation to generation. Right. And our children kind of repeat those patterns. So you want to be really intentional about interrupting the pattern for the sake of your children. And so um, that's a little bit, I'm sorry, this is a, this is a hard one because it's physical it violence. It's hard. It <laughs> it's difficult. SubhanAllah. May Allah make it easy. I mean, I ask, Sabria, uh, you said you dealt with someone volatile in your work. I don't know. Was it a couple? Were they like, were they volatile with you or was it you dealing with a couple and they were involved? So both. I'm a behavioral therapist. So, I mean, I'm always dealing with um, the threat of violence, obviously, um, in, in my practice. So um, I've dealt with both. Um, the most recent one was dealing with a couple 
that, you know, escalates really, really fast and gets um, to the place where they want to become violent. And so just kind of teaching them communication prompts and them committing to those agreements. And like I said, someone has to be the de-escalator in the situation. And like for me, when I'm dealing with someone who's the violent, aggressive one, I, my job is de-escalation. Like I'm like the problem, I can deal with it once we're de-escalated. But my job is de-escalation techniques. Um, yeah. So both. Have, have you seen, because I think there's an idea that domestic violence situations won't get better and just this idea that people should leave. Um, but I sense from the person asking the question that they want to be in this marriage. So I'm just wondering, have you seen marriages that where there was domestic violence and it stopped and they like completely turned over a new leaf to have a better marriage without violence? Um, I'll say this. I've seen where, where two people equally engage in fights and there's not one particular aggressor. I have seen those shift their patterns. When there's someone that is an aggressor and, and, they're, and they're like kind of repeating a cycle of abuse, that one's really difficult unless they get some really, really serious help. Um, those are difficult patterns to pay, break because they're in the cycle of abuse. Um, so, yeah, those ones I would definitely say, you know, those are domestic violence victims and they need to retreat to safety. I wouldn't even play with that. I would, mm -hmm. I would remove myself to safety. Uh, so, so there are other aspects of the question that um, I'll go to Habib. And alhamdulillah, all three of you women have worked in these sort of um, situations with different difficulties and different relational um, abuses or lighter words than that, subhanAllah. So what about the children here? So she has one child, the oldest child that has already, uh, before I say that, the reason I ask that question is because inshallah, I hope the questioner does have hope in their marriage. I hope things will change, but for, perhaps you need to go to someone and get the help. Like we can give some advice inshallah ta'ala, but you may need to actually go to a therapist and really work on this issue um, actively. Um, so Habiba, what about, once the children see this, how how do they stop that impact? How do they, I don't know, change the impact? Do they say, hey, this is what we're going to try to do now? Do they just do it on their own and hope that the children will get better? How do they, what's the first step, I guess? I personally, it's, 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 it's difficult, but it's one of those things where um, the child has already witnessed the trauma. And so it can... My my thing is is that the trauma and it, it's been it's already very um yeah um I feel like I understand that the concern for the um the question was um part of it was the child's view of what marriage looks like and the child saying that they never want to get married because of what they've been witnessing mm -hmm. but we kind of need to kind of shift it back to something that's happening right now because the child is a child and how is the child establishing relationships now how are they um vocalizing their needs and vocalizing um their concerns in say friendships and relationships if there's a disagreement with friendships and relationships is a, a physical disagreement because they don't agree because of that they've witnessed in the home. So I personally am not, um, I'm of the opinion. If we, if you are going to argue, not physical violence, but if you're going to argue, don't argue in front of the children. Um, and if something gets physical, then you've hit a level where you kind of need to get some additional help, additional support, um, from outside of the home because you need a third party. Um, I find it very rare where two people are, are engaging in a physical altercation can have that level of clarity where they are going to both be able to back up and say, okay, let me think rationally. Because once you're in the heat of the moment, you're in the heat of the moment, you're not going to think rationally. Um, and I feel like that's when you need that mediator, that third party, that person who is there to deescalate. Um, and so in those situations, your children shouldn't, shouldn't see you in that space, in that light. Um, and so I think the biggest concern and kind of what they need to kind of think about is trying to be able to not do this in front of the children. Um, because you know, when your children are watching and children are nosy and they sometimes are, Oh, what's going on? What's happening? And it's like, no, make sure that your children are not watching you in that light. 
um, because that may, that means you need to go work on some things for yourself, but you don't want to damage how your children see you. And if so, the child is seeing how their, say, father slash mother is engaging in a physical altercation with them, that's going to change the opinion that the child has on the parent. So in, in my personal opinion, don't do that in front of the kids. Any type of arguing, disagreement, it's like while you're still in that moment of clarity, you know when you can go excuse yourself to a room for privacy. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what really needs to be done is that if, and we're not saying physical altercation needs to happen. It doesn't. We need to find a way to actually find that third party to help deescalate that situation when you know that it's going to get physical. Um, because like we said, once you have hit a certain part, once you're triggered, <laughs> that it's, it's very difficult to kind of come down from that. And so, um, I do think they may need some additional outside support. Um, but in relation to the children, try your hardest because you have to prioritize their overall well-being to think about excusing yourself to a private space when you think you're going to have these disagreements with your spouse. Mm -hmm. Sister Samira, please. Um, <clears throat> First, it depends on the duration. How long has it been going on? And if it's something that is just acute, it just happened, okay, the mortgage money, she took it and she bought a pair of shoes and got her nails and her hair done, and it's a one-time thing, that's different. If it's ongoing, then after three months, talking to the parents, sometimes what I do, I get them to sit with the children and talk about, you know, sometimes if there is no... Violence. Violence, I do not condone. You hit me once, you're going to hit me again. Okay? So, But sometimes the wife, poor thing, sometimes the sister, she said to me, oh, Sister Samira, he's the breadwinner. So if, he, if, if we get divorced, what will happen? You know, it's a lot. So it depends on the duration, how long it's been going on, the argument, but the hitting, I usually get intervention, get to the social worker. I have children, the children get counseling. It's a holistic approach that I do. Mm -hmm. So then again, we have to look at it. Not, not, it's not a divorce. It depends if he's been hitting you for 10 years and this has been a habit, then the marriage has to go. But it depends on the wife. Many times the wife, sometimes the officers, police are called and she don't want to press charges and she, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a sensitive, but the children, I usually get them into counseling. Mm -hmm. And so the wife, if, she, if mm -hmm. the wife wants to come to counseling, because what I do, I talk to the wife first, talk to the husband. And if there is no escalation or no signs of thing, I bring them together. So it depends on the situation. If it's been going on for a long time, if there is violence, it depends on the situation, but the children get counseling immediately. If it's one time, two time, it, but you know, argue, arg, arguing and talking, raising your voice, it's a difference. It depends when you get into this situation and you, you um, understand if they just sometimes, some of us, I'm very loud. I am a loud sister. My voice, I loud. Sometimes my husband said to me, yeah, Allah. I don't allow. So sometimes we raise our voices and it's not anything. And the children will say, okay, go back to your room. Mommy and daddy will come to you just now. We're just having a little something. It's different. But if it's violence and it depends on the situation. But the children, I always get them into counseling. Okay, so here, here's where I'm going to chime in on this, and I absolutely agree. Agree. This is this is a heavy duty one, and I'm sure quite a bit of this happens in our community because we we've heard about a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say number one, we do not condone violence. Period. Absolutely right. not. Not That's even right. for a day. That's right. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm not waiting on you for ten years. I'm telling you that right now. I'm not waiting <laughs> on you for a week. Not even two days. The first time you put your hand on me, we can have a problem. So this is one of the this is one of the things that we have to make sure again in our communities we have those specialists such as these sisters here to be able to make themselves available but we have to remember 
everyone that's in this field, whether it's a social worker, whether it's a therapist, whether it's whomever in this psych in this psychological um, field, sometimes we don't want to pay to get a service. But I'm sorry, but these individuals have to live. Okay, this is their specialty. They spent a lot of time and energy um, going to school, learning these specialties to be able to come back and service our communities. Some of us would rather go to people who don't understand our dean, okay, and some of the issues that we're going we're going through, and would rather go to the outside to to counsel, you know, and and again, forsake those who of us that have specialties in the community. So getting back to saying this, I think really, again, when we talk about um, intellectual maturity and one continues to learn about themselves and learn about each other and certain things that will trigger each other, sometimes we have to retreat. We have to retreat. You don't have to respond right away when someone says something ignorant to you. You don't have to respond right away to, into a fight. And this goes to both men and women. We have to learn each other's language, right? But absolutely not do you fight in front of your children. Absolutely not do you physically put your hands on each other in front of your children, not even behind closed doors. However, I would say this, in vetting each other, you also need to make that very clear to the person that you're about to marry, that these are some of the things that I will not tolerate. Emotional abuse, intimidation, okay, retaliation. You can go down the list and oftentimes we don't do this when we're vetting someone, we hate to bring up the subject. We just think that they know that these are things that we're not gonna be tolerate. And we also noted that some of us come out of relationships and families that we see abuse so much that we think abuse is normal. It is not normal, sisters and brothers. It is not. Your child, your wife is not your child and your husband is not your child. Even with your child, you don't abuse them. But that's another conversation that we can get into. But as the adults, as the example, Uh, inshallah, she'll be back on very soon in the middle of a great point. Um, Hamda and I all gave really great responses, and I just want to want us to address the last part. Um, I don't want that to get lost. I know maybe for some of us it doesn't feel like the most important thing, um, but the sister does want to know how can she begin to repair the way her children view marriage? How does she begin that? Um, SubhanAllah. Um, I think what the sister said, I think the sister Habiba touched on it beautifully. Um, you know, the thing is, is that the cycle has to end. You know, you can't be in a cycle of abuse and then wondering what you, you know, how to change, shift the, the perspective of the child. The cycle has to end. And um, I, I'm, I'm so glad we we're taking a strong stance that physical violence is not acceptable. We don't stand for it. We want to make it really, really clear. Right. That it's, it's not something that is acceptable in our communities. It's not something that, you know, we want our children to see or to normalize, normalize in any form or fashion. But I definitely believe children will need support through this. Um, you know, I have worked with children uh, that witnessed, you know, abuse more so on the emotional scale, not so much on the physical scale. But, you know, they definitely need that third party support, like Sister Habiba said, like that just in being able to process it, because what happens is, and I want people to understand that the cycle of abuse is a repeated automatic pattern. You don't know, but energetically you will be drawn to someone who you think, right? I mean, and again, this is all subconscious. You will draw in a partner as the children go into adulthood. This is how important I want you to understand how important it is to interrupt this cycle now. The children will repeat the cycle by being attracted or draw in a partner, right? That on a subconscious level, it just looks familiar. So it's comforting and they'll register it as safe, right? But it doesn't mean that it's functional or healthy. And they'll get into a cycle and sometimes they'll repeat this cycle of abuse in an attempt to heal the original wound. 
the original wound and the original trauma that with the experience of this kind of seeing this abuse kind of play out, that will be on repeat. So it's fundamentally important, and I'm not doing this to try to make anyone feel bad or to shame anyone, subhanAllah, but just that it's important to break the cycle for the sake of their future, right? Sometimes we got to take ourselves out of the boxes, like for the sake of their, their future. I remember having a narcissistic a relationship that was, uh, you know, borderline abuse. And what got me out was that my, my I, I was not going to have that pattern for my kids. So I got out super fast. Right. And so sometimes, you know, it, you have to be that radical because what we're doing now is we're repairing adults that have seen this cycle in their childhood that they have on repeat over and over and over. And they're attempting to be repaired in their 30s, 40s and 50s. We don't want that for our young people. We understand now. We have awareness now. We have resource people in our community. We don't need that for our children. So we want to interrupt this pattern right here and right now. And if our children have witnessed it, we want to get them third party support so they can have a good framing so that they won't repeat the cycle and repeat the pattern. SubhanAllah, thank you for adding that. And I guess what I wanted to maybe have, I think Habiba, Habiba, were you about to chime in? I was also, I'm just going to jump in and say, with the third party support, as a family, support what everyone needs to be on the same kind of plan. Because I've often seen with, um, with being a therapist is that we can't do everything. We need the support of the family to also go in line to what we're doing. So when it comes to us, you know, having, you know, third party support with these children, um, that means that the, the parents need to also kind of fall in line when it comes to having a little bit of different communication methods and being able to um, show their children what it's supposed to look like. They've already seen the trauma. We understand that. But when they're getting third party support, that everyone kind of supports what's going on for the benefit of their children. Um, because you can disrupt, you know, everything that's going on, but if the children are going to continuously see what's going on and go to therapy, um, it's not going to be consistent. So we need to kind of create a little consistency when it comes to you disrupting the trauma and taking it out of the home, but then also be able to repair it. So we don't go back to, you know, um, things that are more comfortable, which may be lack benefit. So, excuse me. So one last, and uh, hopefully Sister Samira as well, you can chime in. What do we say to a sister who, okay, she's she got it. She has to go to therapy. The kids need some, some third-party support too. But what does she do right now? Because clearly she's feeling some guilt about what her children have seen, how it's impacted their view on marriage, is there something she says right now to change their views? Is, she, is there something she does in, you know, immediately, or is this just a long-term process and, and that's what it is? Um, oh, go. No, no, I was going to say just one thing, and I'm going to hand it off to you, but I was going to say definitely give them space to emote and express. Give them that free space to emote and express. And also, it's really powerful when we can apologize to our children and we take accountability because we teach them, you know, that that beautiful pattern. Things do happen in life. We do make mistakes. That is a part of life. But allowing them to unpack it with us and us being a safe landing place for that unpacking. I'm not defending. I'm not making an example. I'm not making excuses. And I'm off, also offering a very sincere and authentic, loving apology um, and, and an attempt to sort of repair that. And so um, that's just one tip I would suggest. But Sister Habiba, go ahead. And you said it perfectly because I find that within our community, it's very difficult for our parents to apologize to their children. Um, that needs to be part of it. An authentic, sincere apology with the intention of changing behavior. Because we can apologize all we want. I can say sorry for stupid stuff. But if you don't actually mean to change your behavior, then it's empty words. So in this case, the immediate thing that if you feel a sense of guilt, you feel that there's a sense of you do want to change the first thing, of course, like Sister Sabria said, space, but we do need to consider the fact that you need to apologize to your children. Um, that concept cannot be foreign within our community anymore. Unfortunately, um, I, you know, I often see within our community parents like, I don't need to apologize to a child. That's my kid. I can do what I want. And it's very detrimental to how children kind of 
develop relationships. So the first immediate thing is a sincere apology and this idea that you are in, you're actually going to change your ways. Um, it's not going to be an easy journey. We recognize that, but a sincere apology does, it works, you know, wonders if you actually mean it. Um, so that's, um, the mind. Yeah, I, just, I, I do apologize for, um, you know, computers giving us problems, but I, I do want to chime in on that. And for me, I, there's no apologies for me to give and give to anyone because I am very emotional about this. And I'm emotional about it because I grew up in a situation seeing a lot of stuff going on around me. And I know how it affected me. And I knew that I had choices, right? So I knew from a child that I had choices on what I was going to tolerate and what I did not want to tolerate. Um, and growing up in a culture, and again, I came from a Caribbean culture, where a lot of this abuse was very normal, very normal, and um, no one addressed it. It was a secret, and and people never talked about it. There was no counseling about it, and I think really that's one of the things that drove me um, into counseling, because I wanted to understand how could another human being treat another human being like that if they say they love them, if they say they, that they respect them, right? And I get all of the emotional unpacking and all of that. But when again, when you are in a situation, it is really, and for a lot of women, it's about surviving. It's about surviving. It's about surviving, surviving you and your children, taking them out of that situation. And again, as I, as I wanted to say before, um, when you get into a relationship, make sure that you discuss these things of what you will tolerate and what you will not tolerate. And how would you be setting up your life in terms of raising children that if you're having uh, a disagreement, the disagreement should not be in front of the children because the children don't even understand what it is, what it is you're disagreeing about. So it's best for you to then create that safe space, not only for them, but for yourself to have these discussions behind closed doors. Because you may be responding to things and all of all the child is hearing is that something is terribly wrong. I'm feeling unsafe, but they're not going to express it to you. But you're going to see behaviors change in terms of schooling, in terms of sleeping, children all of a sudden wetting their beds, children being withdrawn. And you're trying to think, oh, what's wrong with this child? But I do have to agree with the sisters that um, apologizing to each other is so important and somehow people think that oh that's so about me to apologize to my child are you kidding me that is your child you always have to remember that you're teaching that child how to behave how to communicate and it's okay to apologize to someone if you are sincere about the apology this is not about, oh, I'm apologizing to you because I know you don't want me to hit you in front of the kids or whatever, so let's go, you know, let me hit you behind closed doors. Then I'm going to apologize to them. You may put your child in the living room to watch TV or something and think they're not listening. Guess what? They have tuned out from the TV and they're listening to everything that's coming out of that room that is very unsettling to them. So I want to say to any sister and brother on here, if there's something like that going on in your home, Please seek counseling. Seek counseling, not only for yourself, but for your children. And remember at the forefront, it's about your children. You do not want another generation um, taking that pattern of behavior into their marriage, okay? Because you've experienced it. No, you have to change. You have to change. You have choices. You can either choose to continue um, living a life that you were, that you were brought up in, whether it's drugs, whether it's abuse, whether it's whatever, that was negative to you as an example. And you can choose to say, no, I'm not going to live that life. I'm not going to live that life because what I saw in front of me did not work for me as an individual. Here I am now taking it out on someone else and I don't know how to deal with it. It's okay to go to counseling. In our communities, there is such a taboo about going to counseling, talking about what's bothering you. You have to do it to save yourself, to save your family, and to save the community. Nuri? Alhamdulillah, so, so important. And um, 
subhanAllah, yeah, my, my sister mentioned this and I don't want us to lose this, um, that we shouldn't assume the man is the aggressor, the woman said they are fighting. So absolutely, it's important to address both as we have um, domestic violence in general. Mm -hmm. And in this sister's particular situation, we don't know if one is the aggressor or not. Um, right. Alhamdulillah, I, okay, I'm okay, seeing a question now. Well, we'll get to that, but Alhamdulillah, thank you so much to everyone for being with us. Um, Sabria, we know that you have to go, and SubhanAllah, you have been very hope helpful, Alhamdulillah, and I think that so many people will benefit from this conversation, inshallah, but of course, this conversation alone cannot take someone out of their situation. It could be that spark to get them out of a bad situation, uh, but you have to do do the work. And Hamdina Sabria Mill, she talks about this all the time on her podcast, uh, The Dope Muslima. So please check it out on Facebook and Instagram, I believe. Um, inshallah, Sabria, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. May Allah bless. You, I really appreciate what um, you, Sada Nordin, and your beloved mother, um, Sister Madonna, what you guys are doing here. And it's beautiful to see this, you know, generational trend of kind of having these thought-provoking dialogues and conversations. So may Allah bless you. It was an honor to um, sit beside you, dear Sister Habiba. May Allah bless you in your work. And um, Sister Samira, you know, I feel like we besties. So inshallah, we're going to exchange information through <laughs> uh, through um, our dear beloved Sister um, Madonna. But thank you guys. Inshallah. Have a good night. So, thank you. you. Thank you. So we'll take one more question. Um, I will start with Samira. And if you want to say anything about the um, violence as well. I know you spoke about that, maybe specifically about the children, if there was anything more you wanted to say about um, the difficulties that this sister is having. Um, but with that, we're going to answer one question here, Hamdina. So the question is from Tahira. What about, let's see, what about the guilt that parents put on their children because they stay together for the sake of the children? Interesting. Why do we have to stay? So I guess one is having a difficult marriage and people say, well, we stay together for the sake of the children. Um, and I think she's saying, well, even that can cause guilt for the children. Um, feel free to comment on that. And to hear if you want to specify what the question is there, then please let us know. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa as I say, it depends, age appropriate, it depends on the age of the children. If there is no physical violence, and I repeat, if there is no physical violence, sister, and it's just that it's escalating with voices, that's different. You could sit with your children, and even though if your spouse can do it, sit with them and say, you know, mommy and daddy, we were just talking and we raised our voices and you know, we're not supposed to raise our voices. And you can, when they, it depends on the age of the children. This is why in my head, uh, if the child is 12, if, if the oldest, I think that they said the oldest child was 12 and the younger is three or something like that. Yes. The oldest is 12. That means Salat is established. Like Sister Sabria said, the faith base. Salat mm -hmm. is established with a 12-year-old. So are you going to deal with the 12-year-old differently than you can deal that you can uh, before and you can deal with the 12-year-old and the three-year-old differently? 12-year-old, get books, even the hadith. Marriage, why you say you don't want to get married? Daddy and I, we just haven't talked, but you know, we have to learn to lower voices. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got married certain times, certain people to bring tribes together who were fighting. It depends on age appropriate. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. If there is no physical violence and it's just a matter of raising your voices, that is a learned behavior that can be corrected. But if the children are having trauma, then they have to be counseled. I remember, and I have to go back as an MGT and under, under Elijah Muhammad, 
we had sisters, some things I would do at home and my son, I'm going to Auntie Wahida and they would tell her, you know, mommy did this and mommy, and we had community and Sister Wahida would call me and say, Samira, you're doing so and so with Ami and he don't like it, it's making him upset. We have, we had mediation, we, I mean, we call it mediation now, but we had aunties, all of us had sisters and the children call them aunties. Mm -hmm. So, but there were some sisters who said, what happened in this house stays here and they would put it under the rug. It depends on what we have to, if somebody could get to talk to the sister, mm -hmm. if there's no physical violence, then that's different. We can deal with it. The learned behavior, raising your voice, if your husband is triggered or the wife is triggered with the, the, the tone of the voice or what you say, sometimes we have baggage and we throw baggage at each other. Things happen in our marriage five years ago, three years ago, and you would bring it up like vomit. It depends. So we have to get more information or say to the sister, sister, if there is no violence, it's learned behavior, pressing each other's button. You can get help talking to a sister. You must have a sister you could talk to and talk to the children. Sit down with your children, age appropriate. If it's a child three, draw a picture. This is Prophet Muhammad did marriage. So here is a born marriage. It's little things we can do. It's a very tough situation because we really don't know what is going on and sister let her talk to somebody and talk the truth if she's ever been hit or beaten talk the truth get out i i have no empathy and sympathy i'm serious it may sound cold and sister i don't want to hurt you but if there's violence get out if it's just pressing each other's button or bringing up baggage learn behavior that can be corrected and your faith get up and do tahajud start getting call on allah start getting up for salat, talk to Allah, talk to the sister, even talk to the imam or his wife, and get help, please. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu yeah. alaikum. Um, so um, if we're still talking about the same sister, I think that there would be two different um, uh, interventions that I would you know, recommend. But to be 100% honest, um, when it comes to, can you um show the question again? Because I'm just, I just want to refresh myself. I don't want to. Okay. Um, I will try to paraphrase. It was a little long. So essentially, there is argument, sometimes physical. No, no, no. The one about um. Oh, never mind. I remember we were talking about staying. Yeah. There. I apologize. ADHD mind. <laughs> so, but I don't. This is my personal opinion. Um. I don't believe the children are a reason to stay in a marriage. Um, because if you know that you're already traumatizing your children, you're already doing some damage, um, you staying in the marriage and having the children witness that for years and years and years is only going to make things worse. Um, I recognize that you know, we're, we're discussing about not staying in a marriage when it comes to physical abuse, but we have to recognize that other forms of abuse have a major impact on the lifestyle of a child and the lifestyle of a family. So I don't necessarily think that staying in a relationship that is traumatic, that can be tumultuous, um, is beneficial just for the children. We recognize that being in a two-parent household is beneficial, but if it's not healthy um if it's a poison for the child to be in the home if it's a poison for everyone to kind of be connected we kind of need to this and i i'm not a advocate for divorce all the time i recognize that there is there has to be steps to that but this is after you know you tried marriage counseling you tried mediation you tried all of these different steps that may be necessary but if the steps that you've taken have not um, improved the relationship, they are or your children are still in positions of being traumatized. Um, I I do recommend I do recommend divorce sometimes because we recognize that it's not going to work for everyone. Um, but we it needs to be something that it's not divorce is not the first step here. We need to kind of sure. think about there are there are 
there's steps. There's, you know, multiple, multiple steps. It's not just we have a disagreement. Okay, to luck. No, we need to really start to think about what those steps are. Um, how are those... Um, what what does that support system look like if you're going in that direction? What type of therapist you need to kind of make that decision? But I don't believe that a marriage can be, you know, repaired by simply staying together for the children. That is, a, um, unfortunately, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, that. That's just my opinion. But from what I've seen in um, different relationships, um, different opportunities of counseling, um, it only does more damage than good. So um, that is just my opinion, though. Appreciate that. I totally agree. So, mashallah, we have been here for over two hours, <laughs> a little longer than we expected. Uh, we are very grateful to all of our guests, Hood, Habiba, Samira, uh, Sabria, mashallah. Um, so, again, the podcast was the Dope Muslima. Um, hood can be reached. I think it was written in the comments. Um, subhanallah. I think that was let's see, h dot williams at saturna.com. That is s a t u r n a dot com. Um, alhamdulillah, I, I feel like <laughs> putting the uh, disclaimer that the opinions on this panel are. <laughs> A representative of the individuals, mashallah. Absolutely. <laughs> we, we may disagree. <laughs> but I am serious. <laughs> What's that? I am serious with my opinion. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yes. Um, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so we'll leave it at that. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, Habiba and Samira, do you have any final words? We're very grateful to both of you. Stayed with us for a whole two hours and 25 minutes, mashallah. Um, Samira, I'll start with you. And who's any final? Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah barakatuhu. Oh Allah, I thank you for Sister Madonna and Nuruddin. I was very nervous because I'm not used to this. I'm used to be on a platform talking. <laughs> <laughs> I prayed to Allah that what I have said <clears throat> was if I offended anyone, it's not my intention but I encourage sisters and brothers <coughs> get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose a mate for the sake of Allah mm -hmm. and as the sister said this evening the journey to Jennifer Dows with your mate the prophet said marriage is part of your deen. And I pray that Allah blesses us to help the weak and the downtrodden. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. Habiba, please, any final words? Um, nothing major. I appreciate um and everyone for you know coming to listen to this very important topic um you know may Allah rectify our affairs we're definitely we're in the trenches these days so yes. uh, <laughs> may Allah make it easy for us for our marriages for our children those who are struggling to get married inshallah may Allah mm. bless us with the most I mean. precious spouses I mean um mm. I have been asked before. Currently, I am not taking clients. <laughs> um, I understand that we do want to have Muslim therapists out there, but um, after the session, I will put my email in the comments if anyone would like to send questions. Um, I can really only assist on an email you know, basis, but I, I unfortunately cannot see you as a consistent client. Um, but whatever I can to support, um, unfortunately, I'm only registered in New Jersey. So if it was an opportunity to get clients, it would only be in New Jersey at this time. But um, I will leave my client, my um, my contact info in the comments if anyone is looking for any type of assistance. Um, I will help in the best way that I can. And uh, Jazakallah for the opportunity. Thank you both for your expertise, for all you do for the community, for everyone who seeks out your help. Um, Hamnida. So, Mom, do you want to? I, I just want to say again, thank you all 
for being on this platform. Again, we are trying to reach the audience that really would like us to bring real talk to them, real issues to them. As I have uh, met many young women um, from the summit who really appreciated some of the real talk that they heard and asked, really asked for it. You know, like we, we need to hear more of this to deal with things that's happening to us in real time, right? To give us some guidance, to give us your opinions, give us some of your experiences. So I really appreciate all of you being on the platform, our guests, um, our audience. Please come back again. Uh, next week is going to be an even harder one. <laughs> what is the topic on that one, Nerdy? I think this one is, is about polygyny. Next week's topic is interracial marriage oh, yeah. and black Muslim woman. Another one. So <laughs> please bring, your, bring your thoughts and ideas and um, let's share and have a conversation. And certainly, again, if I have said anything that offended anyone, may Allah forgive me. Uh, but again, my intention is, is that to share, for us to understand each other and to take that information that we share with you to make you think and make uh, so that you can take some action as well in a most positive way. And with that, I say salam alaikum to everyone and have a wonderful week. Salam alaikum to everyone. Inshallah, we'll end with Fatiha. Thank you again for your presence. Inshallah, we'll see you next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.